Welcome back to Shattery Mist, the uh, pot calling the kettle black. Um, and this uh, ambassador for uh, the Saudi Arabians wrote, those who have adopted the view that Assad's regime's continuation in power is the lesser of two evils should be under no illusion as to what their preferred option is, fascism. By the way, it's uh, to recognize the lesser of two evils does not uh, necessitate a preference. It's just a statement of fact that that both Assad and those opposing him are evil, and that the those opposing Assad will be more um, uncivil, more savage to the population of uh, Syria than was Assad, and they will be more menacing to the countries around Syria than was Assad. That doesn't mean that, that uh, or anyone is preferring the evil that is Assad. It's just to say that one ought not provide weapons and support or, uh, or even uh, speak uh, in favor of either side and most certainly shouldn't be arming either side. This man concludes his article by writing, If history is any indication, once a fascist mindset has been uh, uh, integrated into a support base of a regime, peace seldom follows. The quest for vanquishing enemies, both internal and external, never ceases. Well, such is the nature of the very religion that um, has chosen fascist economic systems and political systems every place that it has poisoned Islam. What do you think, Glenn? Is uh, is there any way to uh, differentiate between uh, fascism and Islam in the countries that have a majority Muslim population? Well, I was thinking about that earlier. It's uh, when when I think of fascism in the modern 20th century context, I think of uh, industrial technical powers, and uh, right. Islam yeah. Islam typically doesn't uh, build an economy or build infrastructure you know, well enough to fit the definition of fascism by, like, a modern industrial technical standard. Um, yeah. it, it, may, it may, by an older standard, just in terms of the control mechanisms you speak of. Yeah. But yeah, the difference, you know, yeah, there really is nothing in fascism that necessitates uh, industrialized, but it's probably no, no, from Nazi we, we Germany. Think of fascist nations, I think know. of uh, World War II, Italy and Germany. Right, of course. And, yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. But the reality is that fascism is a economic and political mindset, simply uh, concentrated concentrates control, ownership, and power among the uh, the few, right. and right. And, uh, and therefore, if you look at an Islamic state where, uh, in most cases, uh, royalty are uh, are the beneficiaries, they they are the owners, they are the controllers, uh, they are the lords to be uh, uh, worshipped. As a matter of fact, in a couple of these uh, uh, United Arab uh, Emirate uh, spinoffs, now it is a crime punishable by death to say anything insulting of the monarch. So it's right. a, you know pure. It's just like Nazi Germany. It's a, it's a purely fascist uh, control mechanism that permeates uh, Islam. Now the reason that Islam is not industrialized is because there is no rule of law in Islam, uh, and therefore there's no reason for anyone to invest the time and energy to develop industry. Uh, so there is no uh, uh, effective industry in an Islamic country for that very purpose. Reminds me of the old. Um the BC uh, newspaper cartoon where the disheveled guy would hold up the sign that says the king is a sink. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can't, yeah. can't even do that. The, um, I listened to the SRN news where they said like the Western powers were appalled by the goings on in, the U in Ukraine. And I'm like, yeah, well, okay, it's very simple. Stop subsidizing them. And you won't right. be so appalled. You know, it's just right. crazy. They, yeah, it, the, yeah there, there, is no, there is no resolution of the Ukrainian situation. I mean, that's the, the sad thing there. That the people came out of the uh, control mechanism that was uh, the USSR. They were uh, used to being uh, cared for and controlled by their government, and uh, they moved into this uh, this brave new world of, of free enterprise and uh, couldn't handle it. And so they wanted to continue to be cared for. It, this whole idea of having to be responsible and make their own decisions was not something that they could handle. And they still have this uh, this raw, immoral strain to them that caused them to be the uh, the source of all of those uh, anti-Semitic uh, pogroms uh, during the uh, the beginning of the uh, of the 20th century. 
And so well, they, 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 didn't have the, they didn't have the necessary diversity of infrastructure or work right. ethic. Or look at the history Correct. of the United States that built up, and or look at the history of Europe that allowed for the flowering of, um, of the economies: Reformation, Renaissance, right. infrastructure right. development, Protestant work ethic. They had none of that. You can't just like dump it on them that quick. And yeah. they and they failed, and uh, and it it can't be resolved. So you're either going to have the United States, Europe, or Russia. Uh, have them as their dependent because they are dependent still. Uh, it's why God doesn't like us to be dependent upon our government. They are dependent, and one of those three uh, has to bail them out to keep uh, them from being in total and complete anarchy. But the issue is that the United States is bankrupt, and uh, and we can't do it. Uh, the European Union has really no interest in uh, integrating uh, the Ukraine because they're way too underwater financially. Their debt to uh, to GDP ratio is uh, many times the level that the European Union will accept. And so the only country that is willing to and able to is Russia, and Russia is only able to because the primary contributor to the Ukraine's debt is uh, oil imports. And Russia is the sole supplier, so Russia can can say, all right, we'll give you oil. It only costs us 25 cents a barrel anyway to keep uh, the Ukraine from being a, a total anarchy. Well, the, the, the you know, the, as the one commentator is so uh, fond of saying, as, as long as you have a system where uh, the currency is issued as a debt, it, you know, as a loan at interest, it, it, it oh, there is less currency in circulation than is owed from the t moment the money is issued. You mm -hmm. know, so there there is a way out, except for maybe the Shemitah or Jubilee that thing. You know, wipe the slate and go on. Right. But and then and plus we have John Kerry running around pre preventively tongue lashing everybody. You know, like right. blah, 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 you know, and it's like why don't these people? The only one who's the one who anybody who stole, you know, stood up and told them to go pound sand is basically of all people Karzai. You know, uh, right. Mr. Mr. Chevron Shill. And finally, right. and, and he's he's going to be in trouble because he's doing what. Um, who Saddam Hussein did, and Muammar Gaddafi is starting to care about his people and wants to do good things for them. Well, we know what happens to people who grow a conscience when they've been put in in the show position. Yeah, you know, I actually, I, I'm not going to give Karzai, I'll, I'll give him the first uh, credit for the first thing you said. Um, Karzai is one of the few uh, leaders in the world who's finally said, you know, the United States can't be trusted. Uh, the hell with the United States. I am no longer going to be a puppet of the United States. I give him credit for that. Uh, but I'm not going to give him credit because he's growing a conscience and uh, trying to take care of his own people. I think he's trying to take care of his own hide, which is the, the recognition that uh, once the Americans are out, the Taliban, which has already regained about 80% of its power, will regain 100% of its power within a month or two of the departure of uh, U.S. troops. And as a result of that, if Karzai doesn't begin to side with, release uh, Taliban prisoners, uh, begin discussions with the Taliban for their return to power, then he's a dead man. So I think he's well, yeah, recognized well, that he needs to do it. Caught, caught, he's kind of caught between the suicide bomber and the barrack 50. Um, <laughs> yes, he is. Yeah, yeah he's, he's, he's kind of like uh, Stalin's uh, troops in uh, defending Leningrad uh, during the uh, during World War II. You know, if you, uh, if you uh, shot at the Germans, uh, they were going to kill you. And if you retreated, even to get more ammunition, uh, the, uh, the communists were, the Russians were going to kill you. Yeah, he's in a really, uh, he's not a good man. He is a thief. He is a con artist. He is, as you said, he's a shell uh, of, of uh, Chevron. Uh, but at the time, I think he was actually uh, Unical, uh, but they've all merged uh, together. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and he was, uh, that's why Bush chose him, is because uh, he came out of the uh, of the oil business, uh, and Bush originally uh, invaded Afghanistan not because of Al Qaeda, but because uh, he wanted his buddies to be able to get the pipeline they so desired across western Afghanistan, and he didn't like having to negotiate with the Taliban for the rights to put it there. So I thought if we invade uh, Afghanistan, that uh, the American oil companies will be able to work with the Pakistanis to put a pipeline in western Afghanistan. And of course, what they tried to do and build the roads to do it and tried to uh, to do it, but you, you, you just can't do something like that in an Islamic country, and they gave up. Right, right, right. it's crazy. But, yeah, and so I, I really annoyed with the, the hypocritical, you know, parental yes. uh, dressing down of, of Kerry. 
Terry's terrible. Re- yeah, he's Terry terrible. Should be re- removed from his position as Secretary Correct. of State, return to his old job as Butler for the Adams family. Yeah, I mean that's that's what I look at him too, uh, and, and of course a lot of people look at him as uh, as Lurch. But the the reality is that uh, Kerry is is amongst the most shrill and hypocritical voices in the world today. And when he uh, when no matter what country he's talking about, when he's talking about, for example, Saddam Hussein bombing his own people, then then what was Lincoln in uh, in the Civil War? Are you going to call? Uh, no, he was a fascist. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Fascist. I mean, so if uh, if you're going to uh, to criticize um, Assad for uh, killing his own people uh, in the midst of a civil war, then what was Abraham Lincoln doing? And why are there shrines in Washington to Abraham Lincoln doing it, and uh, yet you want to uh, to tongue lash uh, Assad for doing it? Well, well, he didn't exactly put a leash on Sherman. You know, oh, yeah. and in the Civil War, you see that, you know, it's really one of the first ones where you see, the, like, the doctrine of total war and the devastation of cities, civilian cities and stuff, right. uh, you know, that sort of thing. So we, well, pre- previous to that, even the revolution wasn't conducted according to total war right. strategy, really, you know. Right, and we fought it under uh, guerrilla uh, strategies as opposed to under conventional war strategies. It was an unpopular war, which is the only way that we could actually propagate it that way. I mean, but, even the Brits and the Hessians didn't devastate cities the way Sherman did. Correct. That is that is correct. You know the the American Civil War, which Americans uh, uh, look at uh, Lincoln as the great savior of the country. He actually destroyed uh, what was good about America when he uh, fought that war. It never should have been fought. Uh, but uh, the way that the war was finally won is uh, twofold. One is that Ulysses S. Grant, even though he was a drunk, he could count. And he recognized that he could lose every battle and still win the war because the uh, the North so outmanned and gunned the South, and that's what he did. So he destroyed the military's uh, uh, the South's military ability to defend itself through attrition. Uh, and now the inhuman cost of that, and the fact this man became president, is uh, is incalculable. It's no wonder he was a, an alcoholic. He had to be because you were sacrificing hundreds of thousands of young people's lives for your political agenda. And second, Sherman's uh, march to the sea was a terrorist campaign. It was a scorched earth campaign, the very way we fought World War II, where we firebombed uh, German and uh, Japanese cities. What we are our plan was to make it make the population unwilling to continue to support the war effort through terrorism. And so that's how America fought World War II, and it's uh, how the Civil War was concluded with Sherman's terrorist march to the sea. We don't teach that in school, so you're unique amongst individuals, Glenn, for not only knowing that but be willing to say it. We'll return to Shattering Mess. Stay with us. I'm your host, Yada. You can join this conversation toll-free, uh, 877-300-7645. As we have done uh, over the last couple of weeks, we're going to continue to make our way through the edicts of the uh, Seventh-day Adventists. We're doing this uh, for two reasons. Uh, one is that there are 20 million people beguiled by uh, that particular denomination of Christianity. They're 20 million strong, which means there's a lot more of them than there are even Mormons. Um, and second, that most of what they have to say in their uh, edicts uh, are universally upheld by most Christians, uh, most Protestant Christians for sure, and most Christians generally. Um, so the next item on the list, and we still do have uh, Glenn with us, and I've encouraged him to, uh, to uh, participate. The next item on the list is baptism. Baptism, uh, we confess, by baptism, we confess our faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ to testify of our death to sin and our purpose to walk in the newness of life is their uh, opening statement. You know, if um, if baptism were uh, were something that uh, God thought was important, that it was uh, part of uh, of one's uh, salvation, don't you think that Yosha would have baptized somebody? You know, he never baptized anyone. Never once. He never even used the word uh, uh, baptism, which is a transliteration of the uh, of the Greek word. Um, so when he is speaking of immersion in water, 
He's not uh, referencing a religious act of baptism. He's, he's speaking symbolically of the two roles of water. Now, he explained the, the role of, uh, of water uh, when he had his conversation with uh, Nicodemus. Remember, he said, you know, unless you're born both of spirit and of the water, you're not going to uh, inherit the, uh, the kingdom of heaven? Well, the water birth is our natural birth. We come out of water when we're born. They, they, the sack is, the water is broken just before our, uh, our natural birth. And water is the ultimate solvent. It is a, is it a very effective cleanser, and therefore it's used symbolically of being cleansed. It is also the uh, necessary for life. Uh, there is no life without water. And so water's role in the continuation of life, water's role as a cleanser, and uh, the, the idea that we're born materially uh, as a, uh, as a uh, corporeal material being, and then we're uh, reborn uh, spiritually for those who uh, embrace the covenant, is, uh, is an essence of that teaching. But never once did Yahushua baptize anyone. And so it what, most what certainly... About, what about him being baptized by John the Baptist? Yeah, but, but even then, the uh, the the concept of uh, a baptism as practiced by Christians isn't what is uh, going on there. Oh, he, no, no, uh, and, but but ablutions were ubiquitous throughout the Lord. right. Yeah, he was. Yeah. He he walked into the River Jordan. Now, the River Jordan is extraordinarily important because the River Jordan denotes the the distinction between the world at large and the Promised Land. And so the children of Israel had to cross through the River Jordan to enter the Promised Land. So he is now this, this bridge from the, the world to, uh, to God's home. And so he stands in the River Jordan as an example of being that bridge. And then he is demonstrating how he and the set-apart spirit uh, collectively uh, work to uh, wash us of our sins and how they uh, not only... Uh, provide this uh, this the symbolism of our material birth, but also of our spiritual birth. And it's why when he was uh, in the water, the the dove, which is the symbol of Yahweh's set apart spirit, came upon him. Is that the symbolism there is that you're being cleansed by and being born anew by the set apart spirit. So it isn't an act that that saves, it is simply a symbolic act that demonstrates our understanding of this profound truth. That's all it is. Right, right. The, um, that, now, it's interesting, you mentioned the, the spirit that's descending upon uh, Yasser the Dumb. What about the voice from heaven? Yeah, it would, yeah. yeah Yahweh proclaimed that uh, as he sent the spirit to uh, uh, down his set apart spirit down upon Yosha, that uh, that this individual represents me. This is my son, and so yeah, is he is uh, he is he is affirming. Yeah, he is affirming an extraordinarily uh, profound connection here. And by son, Yahweh is presenting himself as father. So they're identifying this relationship of father-son. Now, of course, Yahusha is a corporeal manifestation of Yahweh, diminished and set apart from Yahweh. So he's not a son in the sense of uh, your and my sons uh, being uh, descendants of us. He's not a second-generation deity. More on that in a moment. <laughs> Welcome back to Shattering Mists. Uh, we are beginning to uh, review uh, some of the Seventh-day Adventist uh, uh, edicts um, shared mostly by all Christians. Uh, baptism is their 15th edict. By baptism, we confess our faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
Larry, I know you're uh, you're listening here. Uh, if you knew Yausha, which is his real name, as opposed to the misnomer Jesus, if you knew that he was the work of Yah and Yah saving us, not the Christ, the Christ being used here as a last name, and it's not a name, it's not even an accurate title. If you knew that God didn't die and cannot die, if you knew, in fact, there was no bodily resurrection, uh, then the faith would be counterproductive, and even if uh, uh, these things were true, faith uh, would be uh, um, the opposite of knowing. So why would one confess one's faith? If, if you have faith, it means you don't know. Well, what, I, what I'd like to point out here is that, uh, you know, we're to look at the Torah for these things. Uh, All right. And Abraham uh, uh-huh. didn't believe in God. He knew, right, he knew him. He knew him. Uh, he yeah. talked with him. He walked with him, and he decided to trust him after knowing him. Hey, let me ask the question to you, Larry. Um, do you believe uh, God? Do you have faith in God, or do you know him? Uh, I, I I know him. Uh, I, right. I don't. It, it isn't a question of do I believe in God. That is a, a pointless issue. Right. The issue is whether or not I can trust and rely on him. Uh, out of knowledge, and right. I do have an understanding and knowledge. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah, you've chosen to trust and rely on him because you've invested the time, you prioritized what he had to say, and you've uh, come to the point that you have chosen to trust and rely upon what he is offering because you've made that transition from knowing him to understanding what he was offering and put you in a very powerful position. It's, it's what I tell people, like this morning I had an interview on Man Cow's uh, show where, uh, where he's opposed to organized religion. He knows there's something really troubling about uh, uh, organized Christianity and about Paul, but uh, you know he's not to, to the point where he knows. Faith, he? Right, so he's still he's still in the realm of, uh, of faith. And and what I uh, I told him, as I said, I know this sounds scary. That what I'm doing here is I'm uh, pulling the rug out from underneath your religion, and that might sound a bit scary. But I'm going to tell you that what you find when you give up religion in terms of a relationship with God is so vastly superior. But I'm really not taking anything from you and giving you some, offering you something that is vastly more rewarding. Yeah, I, I would add this. Yahweh, a hundred percent of the time, opposes religion. Yes. Yahusha railed against religion. Hey, by the way, Mankow recognized that. He says, yeah, I, I recognize that. Every time he was talking to the Pharisees, for example, he was criticizing them. So you're right. Yahusha yes. was anti-religious. So he says, you know, I get that. So, Yahweh, I mean, well, we know that the third statement he makes, often called the third commandment, and right. it's the only one written that could actually be confused in a command form, and it's probably because he's so angry about it. Yeah, he says true. not to associate him or his reputation with religion. That's what he's right. saying there. Right. I don't care what, it isn't, no, show. Uh, not take the Lord's name in vain. Yeah, you know something, Larry. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw out a proposal here that uh, I don't think I have shared before, and you uh, feel free to uh, to disagree with it or challenge it. But there is more to that statement, uh, Yah's third on the uh, on that first tablet. Then uh, you should not mislead and uh, and promote deadly myths in my name, because I will not forgive you. The the um, Actual text, if you, if you really just get to the, the core of what he's saying, is that his argument here is against the negation of his name. His argument is against those who would belittle his name, for example, by, by removing his name from uh, their religion, from removing his back. name for his, uh, uh, from his own testimony and replacing his name with a satanic title, he says, that I will never forgive. Now, I want you to go one st- oh, take one step further on this. In the religion I'm of Christianity, right okay, all right, in the religion of Christianity, is Yahweh's name uh, used? No. Okay, in the religion of Christianity, is Yosha's name used, which de- de- tells us that it's Yahweh saving us? No, neither is his no. title, Masiya, or they would so, so all three, all three are uh, replaced, and uh, and they're replaced by 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 false names, and uh, the religion itself. What what is the religion called? 
Christianity. Right. Is it? Uh, does there? Is there any reference to the covenant there? No. Is there any reference to Yahweh in the religion? No. In fact, didn't they not only uh, remove Yahweh from their religion, but didn't they also negate his testimony in the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms so that uh, they could have uh, Paul's uh, uh, Gospel of Grace? Yeah, sure. They replaced, they replaced the mercy in Yahweh's Torah, which is Yahweh's uh, Okay, now let me go one step further. Yeah, let me go one step further. All right, so that's Christianity. Christianity is in wholesale dis, uh, discord with uh, Yahweh's position here, which means that there can't be a Christian that is forgiven, because that's what God says. Unequivocally, there will be no forgiveness for someone who does what Christianity has done. Now, Let's look at rabbinical Judaism. Do you find Yahweh's name in rabbinical Judaism? No, no. They're guilty of the very thing, very same thing. All right. They call him Hashem, the name. They won't say his name. In fact, it's a crime punishable by death. Right. And Adonai. Uh, right. Replacing his name with uh, Adonai, which means my Lord. Uh, all right. So the Judaism uh, diminished uh, the value of his name. In fact, the Masoretes which are responsible for the Masoretic text that they, uh, they use, the Masoretes actually came up with a system for diminishing the, the merit of Yahweh's name, making it impossible to pronounce. Shoah. Right, the Shoah system, which means to corrupt. I mean, lifeless. <laughs> yeah, it means, means, yeah, to corrupt and to be lifeless. All right, now I'm going to go with the, uh, the, uh, the fastest-growing religion, Islam. Does Islam have a, uh, refer to Yahweh by his name? No, no. Did they, re did they replace his name? Yes. Well, they, they, they actually invented it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, with, with Allah. Yeah, replaced it with Allah. And didn't they not say that Allah is greater than uh, any other uh, god, meaning that uh, their god is greater than Yahweh? Yeah, that's so right. Is, so there is not a single Muslim that has been forgiven. There's not a single religious Jew that has been forgiven. There's not a single Christian that has been uh, forgiven. So, you know, if, if you look at the statement that uh, Yahweh etched in stone, you can make very dramatic statements that are uh, at wholesale conflict with the world's perceptions. There's not a single religious person in this world who has been saved. Not one. That's, that's, that's correct. And that's one of the things I, I was just trying to point out is that God was vehement about not being a religious deity. He wants to be greeted as an individual. That means I walk up to him and shake his hand. Okay, so if we were to, to so if we were to follow the example that Yahweh and Yahusha set, and by by and they're really one and the same. Uh, right. Okay, we've got Yahweh us having second only to professing the path that leads to him uh, denouncing religion and politics throughout his Torah, Prophets, and Psalms. And we have every single encounter between Yahusha and the religious and political community with him exposing and denouncing them. So, That's right. based upon the, those that example, would it be godly or ungodly to denounce religion and politics? It would be uh, godly. And it would also be in, in line with his speaking to expose it, condemn it. And, and let, me ask you another, let me ask you another question then. Um, since God does say that he's infinite in, in mercy, is it merciful, is it compassionate to expose and condemn religion? Yes, it is. Yeah. It, it, would, it would be the opposite. Uh, by, by the way, let me, let me just throw something else in here since mm -hmm. we're on the track here that we know Yahweh's not a religious deity, and you were just talking about water. You know, Yahweh said matter and space shall exist in the midst of the waters, mm -hmm. existing, dividing, and separating for the purposes of understanding waters mm -hmm. in the midst of waters in relation to the waters. Right. He's talking about uh, the way planets are, are right. actually developed. Yeah, yeah. And, and this is... This molecular, after molecular water is the uh, second only to hydrogen, is the most prevalent... Uh, a molecule in the uh, the universe, and so he's, he's actually talking there about the creative process. Uh, uh, of, uh, but he's but beyond the creative process, he's also talking about the role that water plays in our understanding of life, uh, right. and, immortal and, 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 and eternal. And a later, uh, all this he said is confirmed by science. Matter and space and time right. produced right. out of, of a light big bang. He used right. that term, second right. line in Barashif, right. and. Uh, 
So, if, I just, so if you get right back to what you were saying at the beginning, if uh, if we're going to base something like, for example, baptism, uh, which is a Greek transliteration as opposed to the uh, the Hebrew, but if we're going to if we're going to base something on something happened in the Jordan, something uh, is uh, is important relative to water, something's according to Yasha is important symbolism associated with the water with the Spirit in his conversation with Nicodemus. If we're going to look for the role water plays in our relationship with Yahweh and our salvation, should we not look to Yahweh's presentation of water in the Torah? Sure. Absolutely. And, and doesn't Yahweh constantly talk about the cistern of life, on how uh, the water provides the life, how water cleanses? He has instructions in his Torah, guidance, as to uh, how to use water for a cleansing perspective. And doesn't he, in his creation account, explain how life emerged from waters? Yes. Yeah, so yeah, it's, it's really all there. Yeah, and, and in the Torah? And it's... It's in the Torah, Larry, does he, yeah, I was going to say, Larry, in the, in the Torah, does, doesn't Yahweh also uh, explain the importance of crossing the, the Jordan? The Jordan, once you cross through the waters of the Jordan, you enter the Promised Land? Yeah. So why right. should we be surprised to find Yosha in the, the Jordan at the beginning of his, uh, uh, his earthly ministry? No need to be surprised. I, I just uh, I just wanted to point out that yeah. what Yahweh says is true, and he's not a religious deity. And, mm -hmm. and my point being that that any time we're associating Yahweh with faith, which is back to what we were talking about, we're talking about religious notions, you know, right. faith yeah. in the unknown. Well, know. here they, they're, they're confessing their faith in the death of Jesus Christ. Now, so <laughs> how, is it, how is it that God, who is immortal, can die? Well, he didn't. His, his, well, his right. nephish well. soul was in Sheol the next okay. day. Yeah. So, so if God died, why did he say, if, why did Yosha say uh, before his, uh, uh, his body died on the cross, and the body is different, you know, God's not a physical body, uh, before his body died is the Passover lamb, why did he say, my God, my God, would, why have you forsaken me? To forsake means to leave, to desert. So God left him at, uh, at that point because, well, God can't die, folks. And it's amazing that Christians can't process that testimony. During this, uh, we have uh, Larry with us, and we're uh, considering the 15th edict of, uh, of really Christianity at large, but uh, specifically stated by the Seventh-day Adventists, and uh, they wrote, By baptism we confess our faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We've already explained that there is no Jesus, there is no Christ. There is a Masaya Yahusha, uh, but if you don't know his name or his title, you most certainly don't know him. Well, we've uh, dealt with the uh, the death, the fact that God can't die. And so this uh, Christian focus on death is, uh, is ghoulish and ridiculous. Uh, but resurrection, bodily resurrection, Larry, um, can you tell me what the one common denominator is amongst the uh, the three scenes that uh, are witnessed to on uh, first fruits on uh, Bukotam, uh the firstborn children, when uh, Yosha's soul uh, emerges from Sheol and Yah and is reunited with Yahweh's spirit? There's one common denominator in the three eyewitness accounts on that day. I know what, what that was it? Is. Yeah, they didn't recognize him. Correct. <laughs> Yeah, and as a matter of fact, even at the uh, the end of his uh, his final stay, when he's going back and forth between heaven and uh, and earth, and he uh, he joins the uh, his disciples, he joins the boys for a uh, breakfast, and he shows up at breakfast with his disciples. Now they've all seen him uh, walk through a wall, so he's not in a normal body anymore. Uh, they don't recognize him at the he's breakfast. Not Shaolin priest, so right? He's he not have been able to do that. Right, so he, he they didn't even recognize him when he showed up for breakfast uh, later uh, during his uh, his final uh, 30 or 40 days with him. They didn't even recognize right. him then. So if the point of, of uh, that Yosha was trying to make is that you can kill God, but uh, God can come back bodily to life, and therefore you should uh, uh, place your faith in this Christian religion, wouldn't the single most important point that he would want to prove 
is that when he rose from the dead bodily, that everyone recognized him and said, ooh, he rose from the dead bodily. And would you not, wouldn't you expect the opposite of what you read in the eyewitness accounts that no one recognizes? Not his mother, not the women in his life, not the disciples, not the two guys that had witnessed what he was doing on the road to Emmaus. Nobody. So what we're dealing with here is the eyewitness accounts destroy the single most important element of Christianity if Christianity is to be, to be believed. As does Yahushua's testimony. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which is a direct citation out of the 22nd Psalm telling us where we should turn if we want a real uh, uh, eyewitness account of what was occurring here. Where he says, you know, I, I'm no longer, God's no longer here. God can't die. Uh, it's, it's astonishing, and they continue to, uh, to promote it as if it were true when their own text negate it. You know, it's interesting, of course, is the, the death of Christ is, uh, they say, is equivalent to the death of sin. Uh, in them, their death of sin. So do you think that there is such a thing that uh, you uh, you confess faith and all of a sudden uh, you're dead to sin? Did, when you elected to join the covenant, Larry, did you become perfect? Uh, well, yeah, I did in, in, in Yahweh's eyes. But... How about in your wife's eyes? How about in your wife's eyes? No. No, no, no. And, and the same thing is true for me. Uh, I became perfect from Yahweh's eyes, which is really all that really matters to me. Well, it does not. No, I would like my wife to view me as, 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 as good, too. But, I mean, I'm still a flawed individual. And the, the point there, of course, is the most beloved individual for Yahweh is Dode, David. And uh, he continued to be quite flawed as a human. But his relationship with Yahweh was perfect because he knew how to observe the uh, the Torah. And so we don't die to sin. Sin doesn't die in us. The uh, Yahweh covers us in a garment of light, and our sin just becomes invisible to God. That's why God can't be all-knowing because he does not know, uh, has no recollection of anything that we have done that is wrong. That's why we are able to enter his home, looking perfect. Well, there, there's all kinds of Christians out there that have been, you know, like the serial killers, like BT, B, BTK. Uh, you got uh, you got uh, Jeffrey Dahmer. He was raised in a good Christian household. Yeah, yeah. Perfect Christianity. He was a cannibal out of uh, yeah. living dead bodies. Well, uh, of course, in, in Roman Catholicism, this next point, which is point 16, uh, the Lord's yeah. Supper. Yeah, isn't uh, isn't the Eucharist based upon this myth that the Roman Catholic priest turns the wine into blood and they turn the uh, the wafer into the body of uh, of their mythological god, Jesus Christ? Yep. And what did, what did God say about uh, cannibalism? Uh, I, I, that's a no-go. It's a non-starter. Don't go there. What did he say about blood? Yeah, don't drink it. Don't drink it. <laughs> so the Roman Catholic position is wholly uh, and completely uh, the antithesis of what God said. And, and by the way, God didn't say, I'm turning this wine into blood. I'm turning this unyeasted uh, wafer into uh, my flesh. He's making a connection.